They're the most iconic relics in bushranging history. But many questions still remain about the suits of armour worn by the Kelly gang at Glen Rowan. How were they made? Who made them? Why weren't the legs protected? Where did the idea come from? The list goes on. Here we will look at some of what we do know about the armour, and a few interesting mysteries as well. It is not an exhaustive account, nor does it provide all the answers, but the information herein was key to understanding the way the armour was presented in Glen Rowan. In mid-1879 the outlaws went quiet, only being spotted occasionally, travelling or meeting with sympathisers. This also fueled rumours that the gang had split up as they were not usually spotted together. By the end of the year, plough mouldboards were going missing throughout the region, some supposedly procured by Kelly sympathisers. Notorious double agent James Wallace was one of the people said to have helped gather the steel. What was initially thought by police to be little more than an oddly specific prank was soon linked to the Kellys via the network of spies the police had established. Daniel Kennedy, a police spy known colloquially as the disease stock agent, informed then head of the Kelly Pursuit Assistant Commissioner Nicholson that the gang had constructed sealed jackets that fit splendidly and were proof at 10 yards. Such a bizarre coded statement was bound to raise eyebrows, but Neither Nicholson nor his successor, Superintendent Hare, seemed to put any considerable stock in it. The notion of bulletproof armour was simply too outlandish in 1880 to seriously entertain, despite later statements of the contrary by certain police officers with axes to grind. The armour seems to have been the brainchild of Ned Kelly alone, though its development must have required a few others to have input. It's not the first time Ned had considered the protective properties of steel, Based on witness accounts, the gang's hideout at Bullock Creek had been made of thick logs and had a door made from the steel ballast of a ship, all intended to provide protection in the event of a police ambush. Here they could potentially withstand a gunfight for a few days if they had enough supplies. In the letters dictated from his cell in 1880, Kelly stated that his intention with the armour was to wear it when robbing banks. The protection it offered would, he claimed, deem it unnecessary to injure or kill opponents, as nothing an armed guard or clerk could do would actually put them at such a risk that it would necessitate violent retaliation. This explanation does not marry up with how the armour was eventually used, so it must be taken with a pinch of salt, or indeed the whole cellar. We also know, based on a reported conversation between Ned Kelly and Joe Byrne at Glen Rowan, that Joe didn't approve of the armour, or at the least had serious misgivings about Ned's faith in it. Constable Phillips, who overheard the conversation, reported that Joe said, I always told you this bloody armour would bring us to grief. It is worth noting that when this conversation took place, both of the outlaws had been seriously injured in unprotected limbs by gunfire. Joe had been shot in the calf, rendering him unable to walk, and Ned had been shot in the foot and left arm, rendering him unable to load his weapons or walk steadily. Later in the siege, Dan Kelly would also be badly injured by a bullet smashing his unprotected knee. Some have suggested that the suit of Japanese armour in the Burke Museum in Beechworth was an inspiration, or that Ned's ideation derived from armoured bandits in the novel Lorna Dune, or that the idea was inspired by the armour of medieval knights. Regardless, the designs for the four suits were unique, and demonstrated a flair for ingenuity while also being fundamentally flawed. The key flaw was the need to keep the arms and legs unprotected for practicality as it made the limbs very vulnerable, demonstrated by the injuries sustained by the outlaws. The mysterious history of the armour has resulted in many myths over the 140 years since the Glen Rowan siege. Most have been perpetuated by people with only a cursory knowledge of the story at best, or narrators telling the story with an over-reliance on oral history. Many of these myths have been repeated so often that for a long time they were blindly accepted as fact. The most notable myths or unverified claims are as follows. The 
This is a pervasive but patently false belief. The helmets of the other three gang members were claimed by Jim Kelly, at one point, to be police forgeries, to what end is hard to gauge, and these claims were published in J.J. Keneally's book The Inner History of the Kelly Gang, and thereafter frequently repeated. How Jim would know anything about the armour or its creation is unclear, as he was in a jail in New South Wales at the time it was being developed and constructed. Indeed, there is nothing concrete to suggest he was even back in Victoria until well after Ned's capture. Any claims Jim would have made in this regard are unreliable at best. Nevertheless, the claim was accepted as fact by a range of authors including Frank Clune, Charles Osborne and John Maloney. Maloney's justification for his stance was that only Ned needed one as he was to be at the forefront of any dangerous activity. Clune asserted that only Ned was strong enough to wear the helmet with the rest of the armour. The fact that Dan's and Steve's helmets were photographed with the other parts of their armour after the siege with visible fire damage to boot and remained in police custody thereafter demonstrates this claim to be untrue. Joe's armour has been in police custody, then private hands, since 1880, and at least one witness reported seeing the helmet being removed with Joe's body from the burning inn, thus further indicating that there were helmets for all four suits. However, those who accept the claim seemingly find it easy to dismiss the helmets as some elaborate and pointless hoax by the police, if only to preserve the iconography of Ned Kelly being distinct from his gang. Over the years, there have been stories handed down that, in addition to those worn by the outlaws, suits of armour were crafted for the sympathisers. While there is anecdotal evidence that people have seen these alleged suits, or know where they were hidden, there is nothing tangible that has ever been released publicly to confirm this, and therefore, it must be treated as unlikely to be true. There is certainly a lack of reporting in the newspapers at the time of anything that would indicate large numbers of suits of armour being made, or found, that might indicate that the gang's supporters also had their own bulletproof armour. There are people who have claimed to have seen or found some of these suits, three of which were claimed variously to be submerged in a dam, buried on a farm and hanging up in a barn, though the actual locations are a well-kept secret if true. It would also be extremely difficult to prove that any suit of armour found in one of these locations actually dates back to 1880 as anyone with the tools and know-how could craft their own suit at any time using antique metals, as evidenced by the number of replicas made in precisely this manner. The replica armour on display in Kate's Cottage, Glen Rowan, and the Beechworth Courthouse are excellent reproductions of the techniques and materials, but cannot reasonably be mistaken for the real deal, though some proponents of the myth that only Ned wore a helmet would have people think that they'd been mistaken thus. As any validity to these claims is yet to be objectively established, they remain well within the realm of rumour and gossip. It has been claimed that some prototype armour was constructed from materials such as saw blades, sheet metal and india rubber. One anecdote states that there was even an early iron prototype made that was so poorly constructed the gang abandoned it. Other oral history, oft repeated by bushranger historian Gary Dean, states some additional suits used the same iron plates as the four gang members suits, but were wired together instead of bolted and riveted. It should also be noted that this is usually used as evidence for the Dan and Steve survival myth, as he claims these suits were worn by them and hidden in a dam after they escaped the inn. Again, any evidence of this is either long gone or well hidden but it is likely that the gang tested other methods and materials before landing on the design they ended up with. It is possible some of the rumoured additional sets of armour may have actually been crafted by sympathisers after the siege, and spawned not only the stories about extra armour, but also that the gang used different materials to construct the armour. This would have also helped fuel the rumours of Ned Kelly's Phantom Army, which Ian Jones was a proponent of.
Much debate has been made regarding the construction of the armour. The more widely accepted version is that it was constructed with the aid of a bush forge to heat the iron to a cherry red, then beaten into shape over a green log half submerged in a creek. The location of this forge was long rumoured to have been either at the Kelly Selection or Maggie Skillion Selection. An early iteration of this account is found in J.J. Keneally's book The Inner History of the Kelly Gang, wherein he states that Dan Kelly and Tom Lloyd constructed the armour at the rear of Maggie's property, then buried the offcuts and forge once they were done. This version also states that only Ned had a helmet, and the others were fakes, so it must be taken with a grain of salt, though scientific testing conducted on Joe Byrne's armour seems to confirm that the armour may have indeed been made using a bush forge as suggested. There were also partly buried blacksmithing tools, the remains of a hearth, and what appears to be an offcut of Joe Byrne's breastplate, uncovered by Darren Sutton after a 2003 bushfire that passed through the Beechworth area. There are also accounts of people seeing traces of tree sap on the inside of Ned's helmet, suggesting that the notion of them being shaped on a green log may be true. Many suggest only an expert blacksmith could reshape a collection of player mouldboards into the iconic crude plate armour that we know today. Names raised in connection to the construction of the armour include Pat Delaney, Tom Straw Hare, and George Colf. When blacksmith Nick Horton was tasked with creating a set of replicas of the four suits, he had to investigate the methods that would have been employed as well as materials. It was his conclusion that the suits were likely constructed by blacksmiths using a range of metals, but possibly modified and adjusted in the bush where a creek could be used to quench the metal. He also suggested that the suits worn by Ned and Dan were created by the same blacksmith due to the similarities in the construction and design, while Joe's and Steve's were made by different blacksmiths, Steve's in particular, seemingly made from mostly scrap metal and much less competently. What we need. Christ, it's damned heavy. The Bible says, turn your armor into plowshares. But I say unto you, turn your plowshares into armor. We'll be crippled. I am mad, Ed. Mad. Listen, for months now we've had to run because the traps have had all the power and all the steel. Now we can attack. With these, we can become invincible. Just a dent. All we've got to do is to find the right situation. And draw them all. Dig ourselves in. Protected by our iron and our armour, we can shoot them all down. All the traps of Victoria. If you kill one, you're a murderer. If you kill a hundred, you're a hero. I don't trust it, Ned. Still. It could be a spree. One of the most fascinating things about the armour is the stories about the gang members it tells through the unique styles of each suit and their respective flaws. 
Steve Hart's helmet with its extra white eye slit seems to be the most inexpertly constructed. Not only does the brow guard only wrap around far enough that the bolt barely secures it, there is a notch in the faceplate where a hole was punched too close to the edge and a split on the opposite side of the faceplate where it seems a cut was misplaced. The backplate is one large piece indicating that it was made from sheet metal rather than moldboards and looks to have been damaged then stuck back together in spots. By comparison, Dan's helmet is the most refined with a symmetrical design that features a separate plate for the brow and the eye slit narrows when the faceplate is pushed up. Only Joe and Dan had thin plates that joined the front and back of the body armour. Because of the restrictive nature of the armour with the side plates attached, that would impede the process of donning it, and it is likely that the sides had to be bolted in after the armour was put on, or the body armour had to be slid on over the head like a rigid life jacket, with both scenarios requiring assistance from at least one additional person. The inverted bullet dent on Ned's breastplate demonstrates his was made first, as this was evidently a mark from testing. Dan's has a very similar construction to Ned's, and the helmet looks very similar, so it was probably made by the same smith using improved techniques. Joe's suit may have been made in between the two given that it is both less refined looking than Dan's and more competent in its construction than Ned's. Very possibly Steve's was made last using scraps because he was hesitant to get involved with the Glen Rowan plot or because the gang wanted to speed the process up by doing it themselves concurrent to the other armour which was shaped by professional blacksmiths. Of course this is merely speculation based on available evidence and impossible to prove definitively given the construction of the armour was deliberately performed in secret.